Fellow Pelicans and friends of the UWI, welcome to Pelican Talks, a Google Hangout where we promote interactive and positive discussion about a variety of topics and engage our UWI alumni across the Caribbean and the world. It's my very great pleasure today to have as our special guest, celebrated Haitian-born author Edwige Dantica, who is also a UWI honorary graduate. Welcome, Edwige. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you for being here. We're delighted. So to all our Pelican Talks listeners, American, Haitian American author Edwige Dantica is known for her ability to depict timely issues in a way that brings the reader into a world outside fixed geographic, cultural, and ideological boundaries. She reveals Haitian immigrant experience and makes the Haitian culture and its vibrant traditions accessible to a very wide audience. She's a fiction writer, essayist, memoirist, documentarian, young adult book author, editor, songwriter, cultural critic, and political commentator. Edwige Gondicat's most notable works include Breath, Eyes, Memory, Creek Pop, a short story collection, The Farming of Bones, The Dew Breaker, and Brother, I'm Dying. She edited Haiti Noir, a collection of stories focused on Haiti, and wrote Great Dangerously, a collection of essays. She was named among Granta's 20 Best Young American Novelists in 1996, and the New Yorker's 20 Exemplars of American Fiction of the Future in 1999. Her work, Farming of the Bones, received an American Book Award. The Dew Breaker, which is a novel in stories, and her memoir, Brother I'm Dying, won the National Critics Circle Award. She also received the MacArthur Fellowship, among many other accolades. Interestingly, she burst onto the literary scene at the age of 25, and the thing I most admire about her is her accessibility, her availability to scholars, teachers, writers, and journalists, and people like me who wish to know about her vision. We're delighted that you're sharing with us today, Edwige, and thanks again for being here. So first of all, you are most definitely a fascinating person. Let's begin with your Caribbean heritage. Where were you born? Um, you were born under the regime of Papa, Papa Doc, I believe. Do you have any memories of that? Just give us an idea. Okay. okay. Well, well uh, I want to say thank you so much for having me. Um, I was born, I, I hear a little bit of an echo. Is that on my end or is yours too? Oh, okay. Now it's better. Um, I was born in Port-au-Prince, Haiti in um, 1969. It was still um, the time of the dictatorship, the Duvalier dictatorship between Papa Doc and Baby Doc. Francois and Jean-Claude Duvalier was 30 years. So I was born on the cusp of it. About two years later, it would transfer from, from um, Francois Duvalier, Papa Doc, to Baby Doc. My parents, my mom was a, a seamstress. She um, made clothes. She made all my clothes until, even when I was in America, until I was about 18 years old. And um, so but she made clothes for people, which was then, back then it was a very... Um, it was a, a good trade back then before you had all the used clothing that's flooded Haiti, certainly, but I'm sure the rest of the Caribbean as well. And uh, my dad was a tailor. He, you know, he made uh, uh, suits and things of that nature, but worked in a shoe store. And one of my dad traces his leaving Haiti story to during the dictatorship. You had the henchmen, the Tonton Marcout, who would come in the shoe store where he worked. And actually my parents met in that shoe store. My dad said that he, when my mom came in for a pair of shoes, he kept giving her the wrong sizes so he could keep her in the store. <laughs> and so we would always say, you know, you were such a player when he, when he told us that story. But, um, and then so my dad left first um, when I was two and then my mom when I was four. And I joined them in the US when I was, when I was 12 years old. Okay, and are you from a large family? Is it just you? I, oh, I'm from, a, uh, I mean, large, not like my parents large. My dad had, you know, 12 siblings and about six of them lived to adulthood. Um, I, but and my mom had six siblings, but I have three brothers and two of them were born in the United States and one, uh, my brother Andre and I were born in Haiti. Okay. 
And how do they view your success as a writer? Well, you know, everybody who has a writer in the family knows this. They think, you know, they're people are always kind of weary of you. <laughs> like, a, they're, you're, it's, it's kind of loud. I feel like now with the next generation of my family, I always have to tell my nieces, I was like, don't put this on Facebook. Don't. So when I was growing up, for me, it was like, don't write about this. You know, it's, this is for us only. So I think they're proud of me. I mean, my, my parents really, they wanted me to be, to go into medicine. My, both my parents, my mom and dad wanted me to be a doctor. But when my father passed away, there was a bookstore in our neighborhood. And they told me, you know, the bookstore owner said, you know, your dad was coming here all the time buying your books to give me. My dad was a cab driver in New York to give people in his cab. And I never knew that. Oh. So that was really uh, reassuring. You know, he never told me that. I think he was, you know, both my parents were not the kind of parents who are like today's parents who are always reassuring. And, you know, they, 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 they loved us, but it weren't very expressive about it. And so that story after, after my father passed away was a really great gift to me in terms of him having his blessing in terms, in, in terms of what I have done in my career. Absolutely. That's lovely. Very nice. Very nice. Well, I've only had the opportunity to visit Haiti once, but it did strike me that despite the harsh history of the island, Haitians have always created great art, great music, paintings, and stories. How do you think this is possible? And is it that there's a kind of special Haitian spirit, despite the chaos and everything that they've been through, that, that this kind of also inspires you? Absolutely. I think the, you know, I mean, it's one possible theory that I've always thought of, that sometimes with the out of hardship can come, is, you know, can come beauty. And people uh, in Haiti seems to, you know, to even the, our musicians, our visual artists, our writers, people really have made um, beauty out of these difficult circumstances. Of course, we would trade <laughs> all the, I'm sure people, I'm sure the artists included, would rather have, um, you know, communally easier circumstances for our people. Um, we don't we want to make these great sacrifices for the art, but since that's the reality of it, people have really, I mean, the creators um, among us, and, and there's so many, people really try to bring beauty into everyday life. For example, um, I'm sure you saw when you were in Haiti, like the tap taps. Mm -hmm. you know, these transportation vehicles. And I think that are in different parts of the African diaspora. But in Haiti, they seem to pop, you know, that are covered with art, you know, barber shops, beauty shops, and just there's so much beauty. People try to create beauty in the mundane and the everyday and inside, you know, and in the same way that, you know, the church brings in stained glass. I feel like, <laughs> I feel like Haiti does that, you know, tries to surround itself with this kind of beauty that, that we can control um, the rest. We can always control, you know, the political and and the environmental, the natural disasters. Those things are beyond our control. But the creators, you know, among the people, really try to, in spite of that, you know, uh, create beauty. One example is after the earthquake. Um, when I went back to the town where my parents are from, and a lot of houses were destroyed because it was near the epicenter. And then there were these tents, so people who were living in these tents, sometimes made of white sheets. And 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 I went to a place where um, some artists were living, and they had already painted on their on their on these tents, you know. And they painted what they had been through. They painted the experience of the earthquake. You know, it's just art, and in many circumstances, is for us a way of saying we are here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's so true. And I, what you said is. It just kind of encapsulates everything that I experienced, so that's for sure. Well, uh, actually, we now have a question from a student at our St. Augustine campus in Trinidad, and they would like to know, what was it like for you to come to the United States as a child? Um, thank you for that question. So it was a shock. I mean, it really, really was. And it's not like now, you know, where we know so much like I'm texting with my relatives in Haiti all the time and we're in contact and they see what the United States is like through the internet and so forth. All I knew about New York where my parents were was that it was cold. Mm -hmm. And so I got there and I just, it felt really big. 
and and we went to live in a building um you know, which is maybe six stories, which felt really tall to me. It was like, for me, my the equivalent in my 12 year old mind was that it's a big mountain. <laughs> and so, you know, you get in the elevator. And then I was shocked that there were all these people, but everybody's door was closed on our floor. It felt very like a prison to me when I first got there. Like, and we didn't know, really, we knew a couple of our neighbors, but we knew them from church. So, it, the church, the building was owned by our church, so we interacted with the people we knew. We had, you know, parties on Sunday afternoon. So thank goodness for that community building. But I thought New York, and at that time, you know, in the 1980s, people were just um, talking about AIDS. It was, you know, at that time. And they had, Haitians were the only ones identified by nationality on the high-risk list. So that meant a kind of stigmatization that kids in school, you know, in my school, we were beat up, we were called names. And so in not speaking, the language was difficult. So it was a really, really um, big adjustment. Um, but gradually, you know, you, you adapt and you get used to it. But it was, it was not very easy. And of course, I missed everybody I left back home. And, and it, it's, it's a big change to go from a kind of community that you've known and then to a, a very new place. And even, you know, at my when I turned 33, which was the age that my parents moved to New York, I just was like, I was putting myself in their shoes. I'm like, how did they do that? To be, you know, you're 33 years old, you leave two small children behind and you're, you know, to go to a place where you don't know anybody. I thought that was just, like, I thought if I had to do that, even now, like if I, if I was, had to, it would be... So, I mean, I would do it because we're human, we adapt, we do what we have to do for the things we have to do. But it just felt, I just understood the full level of that sacrifice, all in the hope that one day they would be reunited with us and that we would have the opportunities that I thankfully have now. Yes, absolutely. As you say, it was very courageous of them. It's very courageous for a lot of Caribbean people to mm -hmm. try new ventures like that. Yeah. I have question now this time from a graduate of our Cave Hill campus in Barbados and they want to know if you face challenges professionally because of your gender um, well I mean one of the things that I feel like is a privilege of, of my work what I do is that I can do it by myself right and so a lot of the time a lot of the writers alone so I don't have like the day-to-day -day workplace gender encounters that um, sadly a lot of women have. You know, um, this the Me Too movement certainly has brought out how much we are, especially in our cultures, like, you know, our women are treated, you know, and and sort of like the trade, the, the sexual favors for jobs and things of that nature that, that our women, in, you know, at least in Haiti, encounter, um, sadly. Um, but so because of the way I work, like I send my thing in, I don't have the day to day, but of course, you know, I think sometimes in the public sphere, especially in, you know, in, in my profession, women are sometimes underestimated in terms of what we can write. And, and especially for your young woman, you know, people is like, you're, you know, sometimes like, you know, when I just started, even though I was 25, I mean, I was creeping towards 30, people would say, you know, Tifisa, that little girl. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it didn't help that I had like a, a baby face, you know, and so things like that, that I, you know, I've had to deal with. Sometimes people underestimate you and, and, but you know, you, we just, all we can do is just do our best and advocate and be advocates, not just for ourselves in whatever milieu and whatever profession we are, but if we're a woman who also has a position, if you're a woman in a position of power, it's important to advocate for women who seem to have less power, you know, so that, so if you're an executive or if you're an educator, if you're a powerful woman, don't fall into that class thing where you're, you're, you're also helping to oppress the woman who cleans your house or the woman who cleans the school. I think it's also, women also have to be each other's allies across class um, lines and social uh, milieus. I think that's very true. And I'm sure many young women and older women would agree with you, but Sometimes it, it seems to be hard for women who've arrived to remember that there are others that they need to help up and, mm -hmm. and give opportunities to. So I'm glad that you've given that message this morning. 
Um, we now have a question from a graduate of our open campus in St. Lucia. And um, they'd like to know, do you travel a lot to see what others in the industry are doing? Or is it that you travel for book launches? Um, well, for me, my travel, like if I want to see what others are doing, all I have to do is read them. <laughs> right? Um, and I used to I used to travel a lot. And that's also the thing that go, this goes back to the last question. I think also women don't talk to each other, especially professional women who are mothers. You know, we don't talk to each other so much, so much about the difficulties of balancing all that, of being a, a woman who is, you know, who is a professional who's trying to do different types of things, but who's also a parent, who's also a mother. And I have a wonderful husband who, who who's extremely supportive, and I wouldn't be able to do half the things I do, half the travel I do. But you still have certain responsibility as a as a parent, as a mother. So I think um, I don't travel as you know, and I and I and I make that choice often. I don't go to. I, I'm not able to go to everything I'm I'm invited to when my children are in school, and that's a and maybe that's a choice that's that's aligned to the fact that my parents were in another country for most of my childhood, right? And so. I try to be around as much as I can for my children. And sometimes I remember I was invited to something and, and I couldn't come and, they, and I said, well, my children have something, you know, in school that time. And they're like, well, can't you get someone to look after them? I said, no, I, I you know, and then this person said, that's not very feminist. <laughs> and I, and no, I, it's, important. it's very important, I yes, think. I know, absolutely. And for me, it echoed so much to my own childhood. And I know my parents didn't have much of a choice and I'm grateful for the sacrifices, but I feel like I, you know, I, that's, that's, these are things that I, that women are always wrestling with as parents. And so I don't, I don't travel to see what others are doing necessarily, but I, I can travel through reading their books and I, and I try to go to as many conferences and things that I can, but one also has to, to balance like the fact that you've been entrusted for a very short period of time the lives of other small human beings. <laughs> That's very true. I, I empathize and I understand. So definitely. Okay, we have a lot of questions coming in. We have now have a question from a graduate in Cayman. And they said that your sales hit six figures after Oprah Winfrey chose you your first novel for her TV book club in 1998. What was that like, that, that sudden burst? Well, it was extraordinary, and it's something like you don't you don't expect. And at that time, you know, the TV show was on the air, and so you go on the TV show. It was it was a very big deal, and I think I have readers from that period of time that are still with me today. It's really it's it's extraordinary. I don't I had no negative thing to say about it. I mean, it allowed me to do you know, some special things for my parents, for my family, for projects that we, we were, I was working on with my uncle in Haiti. So it was a blessing in all kinds of ways. And, and when people, you know, it's, I have this too, that when I discover a writer, you know, you kind of, kind of follow the writer. So I have people from that period who still say, you know, I read you from the Opus book club. And, and the, the gift of that was, it was that it was my first book. So it kind of, it helped me find readers that otherwise I wouldn't have had. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Well, you touch on many topics in your writings. And um, in particular, in your story, Hot Air Balloons, you have a college student who has an affair with her best friend's father. <laughs> but the young woman seemed really kind of, to me, kind of hell bent on self-destruction. Where did the idea of that story come from? Um, well, it's, I mean, I know young women like that and, and, and for, they're like that for different reasons. And, um, and this particular young woman, I was, when I started writing the story, I was actually more interested in this sort of savior complex that she had, right? So she's like, I'm going to Haiti to save all these women where she doesn't, where she has some of her own issues that she's not addressing. And I was really trying to, in that story, touch upon the way that a lot of people, you know, try to solve their problems by going to Haiti, right? That they try to solve their personal issues by deciding, okay, I'm going to go to Haiti, I'm going to save these people, 
and then at the and sometimes they can do some damage, you know, and the, because they're looking for their own, they're looking for their to to increase their self worth by just by just trying to go like mess with people's lives in Haiti. So it's kind of, I mean, and and there's some good that can be done in that, but it's so that that was the that the genesis for the for the story okay. with that particular young woman. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, in your anthology, IT Noir, you write that you began work collecting the stories before the January 2000 earthquake. And that must have been very difficult for you and for all Haitians. But um, I, I think I read somewhere that you found it in a way cathartic. Can you explain that a bit to us? Well, yeah, IT Noir was, um, we, you know, it's a wonderful series. Um, Akashic uh, Books, it, that's run by Johnny Temple, is a publisher here, but they publish a, a large number of wonderful Caribbean writers, including someone who is a dear friend who recently passed away, Garfield Ellis. Mm. And um, and so they published Garfield, they published Harlan James's um, one of his early books. And so it's um, it's a really, and they do this series called the Noir series that covers pretty much every state in the United States. And then they started doing country. So there's Trinidad Noir. Mm -hmm. um, I think I just saw um, Puerto Rico Noir and there's, you know, and there's just all these different and, and there's, there, there, um, I think there's Kingston Noir, but they cover different places. Mm -hmm. and, and the stories are usually dark, you know, mystery type stories. So after the earthquake, we started doing it. Um, and before the earthquake, we started collab, you know, to try to put the anthology and then the earthquake happened. And then we also had stories that had to do with the earthquake and the um, and and the book. But it's an interesting series, and we did Haiti Noir and Haiti Noir Two. And Haiti Noir Two takes you back to some of the older writers, um, like Jacques Stephen Alexis, uh, Ida Faubert, who is a wonderful uh, author that not many people might have heard of. Um, and so it's it it's all it's. I feel like in those two books, in Haiti Noir and Haiti Noir Two, you get a sense of you, you get snippets of what Haitian literature is like, and mm -hmm. translation. Um, because translation, I feel like is it's very it's good to bring readers to the books as they originally are. But for 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 us, at least in the United States, for my for my nephews and nieces who don't read French, these translations also important. I, they get a sense to read um, some wonderful Haitian writers like like Marvin Victor, like Kate Mars, like Yannick Lyons, and little bits of them uh, that, that they have not had an opportunity to read, that they wouldn't have an opportunity if they were, if, if they were not translated. Mm -hmm. Okay. What are the responsibilities of the immigrant writer, in your opinion? Um, well, you know, I try to write a whole book about it um, called Create Dangerously, the Immigrant Artist at Work. And part of it was trying to, you know, quite ask people and question them about what that me meant to them. Um, I think the res responsibility of any artist, any writer, is to tell the truth and the, their truth, right? especially their particular truth. And so... Um, for the immigrant writer, of course, it's a little bit complicated because your truth is um, sort of wrapped up in migration and making sense of your truth in general is, you know, and, and if you come here young and people are saying, you know, they, there's the, all these issues that are brought up about authenticity and, and who you are, should you be speaking that language? Do you belong in this tradition? And so for me, the only thing that's remain consistent whether we're in the moment that we're living with you know now in america and this sort of in in this culture where the president is calling the countries we're come from bad names and so all, the, the only thing or whether you're the, a writer like felix maurice Oloa, who was um staging antigone during the dictatorship in haiti the consistency in, in those things and that in those journeys is the truth people were trying to tell the, the truth as they knew it, whether it was a truth about a community, whether it was a truth about a human being. And inside the truth can be tied citizenry, citizenship, responsibility, educating others. But I feel like it's, um, 
it's the, our responsibility as artists is to tell the truth. And the truth is so powerful that it's gotten some writers killed or threatened to be killed or exiled. And that's the lesson when I was writing the book that I, that I learned throughout that, that whole journey. Yeah, that's very true. Quite an awesome responsibility. <laughs> um, I understand, let's talk a little bit about the book Dew Breaker now. There's a special meaning born out of the Haitian Creole about the title of the book, The Dew Breaker. Can you tell us why you chose that? Yes, yeah, so one, one day sometime, but maybe a couple of years ago, I went to visit a school and there was a little girl there who I was talking to. And then we, she was from Haiti and, and she said, mon papa était un militaire, you know, my dad was in the military. And then, so she told me, and then I started, we started talking and then she told me, I got to who her father was and I was shocked because she was so adoring and she was, you know, she was not, not a, you know, like a young woman. She was like, you know, it was just like fawning over this person who we all knew as a monster, right? If you put his name in and I thought, Oh my God, the beauty of that thing is like how that people can compartmentalize themselves. Like at, at breakfast, you could be having, you know, toast with your adoring daughter. And in the afternoon, you could be torturing people. I just was trying to um, reconcile that. And so I started writing the story about a, a girl who didn't know her father's past. And, and then I started writing about him. And then I thought, you can't write about a torturer without writing about the victims, right? You can't, because that would be silencing them further. Mm -hmm. And so then I started writing, uh, the book is in the, uh, it's a story, um, novel in stories, because all these different voices come in, you know, with this torture and and how they their lives meet with, with the persons who have been tortured. And sometimes when we think about people getting asylum or people getting, you know, shelter somewhere, we think only the good people came, right? Mm -hmm. where, where I was living when I was writing the book, uh, about a mile down the road was uh, one of the people who, in Scarsdale, New York, was one of the people who had been a, really a good a part of the Rwandan genocide. He was living very well um, and um, near me. <laughs> so um, that to me was, was also, you know, that's not like, and migration, not only the people who were victims fled, also some of the torturers fled. I mean, they were more likely to flee to fancy places because they had more money, but some of them sometimes ended up very close to their to the people they had victimized. So that was the inspiration for the for the story. And the, the expression is um Shuket La Ouse, someone who shakes the dew. And I was thinking also, because I feel like I'm always in conversation with my literary ancestors. You know, Jacques Romain has a book called um, Gouverneur de la Rosée, Masters of the Dew. And, and in that book, you know, it's, that book is all about building a community, you know, and he, he wants to, it's almost, um, you know, it has a lesson in it, like we're supposed to be communal, you know. It says, there's a line in the book in translation by Langston News, where it says corporation is the, you know, corporation is the wealth of the poor, something like that to paraphrase. And, and so he's just really like Marxist about it, like build and then, you know, and and because he had just come from Cuba also, the, the main character, Manuel. And so that book is about, such about building community and and, and someone who's a Shuket La Ouse, who's a do breaker is so much about deconstructing community. So that was sort of a, a bit of a conversation with, with um, my elder Jacques Roman. <laughs> That's interesting, very interesting. What has the response been in general to Dewbreaker? Is there a difference in response to Haitian Caribbean community versus mainstream America? Is it what you expected? Well, I never, you know, I never really expect, I try not to expect any response or anticipate any response because it's never, you know, I, it's never, all I can control is what I put out, but it's never what you expect. And so the, the, some people were saying, oh, you were too hard on that guy, <laughs> you know? because he sort of gets redemption at the end. And then others, but I had the, the most interesting response I had was a man who came to one of my readings. And when he came, it was almost, you know, I, it, like he was, like we would say, it was central casting. He could have played, if he were an actor, the role of the father and the dew breaker. 
was a middle-aged man with sort of a middle-aged pred. He had some dark glasses. And I was, I remember as he approached me, a little bit afraid of what he was going to say to me because I felt like, like I know this type of person. But, and then he gave me a brochure of this organization he had started. He was helping children. He was doing so much in Haiti. And then he leaned very quietly and said to me, you know, I was one of these people. Actually, he was on the firing squad that of an execution that I describe in, in the, um, and created dangerously of these two young men who were in the States and went back. And he said, well, you know, and he said, I want you to know that if we had, if I had flinched that day when they were shooting these men, I would have been shot. And that he says, I want you to know that we did these things. Sometimes we didn't want to, but we had no choice. And some of us felt like we had no choice. And, and I felt, you know, I felt some empathy. I didn't feel, I don't completely like say, oh, you're, it's not my right to forgive, right? Um, it's the right of the, pe the people who he needs to ask forgiveness from. He can't because they're dead. But, um, but it, as a writer, you know, it sort of gave me a sense of entry, of empathy to also from the perspective. And the tricky thing about being a writer is that you have to love even the characters you hate, right? And you have to be able to step into their shoes to write about them you know, without like horns on their head, but as humans, as complicated people. Wow, fascinating. Okay. Um, question now from a graduate in Jamaica. They, uh, have, they say you've spent most of your life in America. What is it like for you to write of a place which though in an integral part of your life is now no longer your home? And do your memories of Haiti inform your writing? Mm -hmm. Well, I write, I would say about half of my work now is about Haiti itself. Some of it is um, about what it's, a lot of it is also about what it's like to be Haitian in the United States. So, but I've always been going back and, and forth to Haiti. And I know that, but still I know I'm not writing it about it as someone who lives every day in Haiti. That it's my, and I also have the further distance of the language in which I write, which is a sort of a reality of my immigration experience. So I acknowledge that I'm writing differently about Haiti than I than someone who spends every day in Haiti and has um, a daily experience there. Absolutely, um, I don't. I see that as sort of a particularity of of what I'm writing. And um, in the way I enter the story, every writer has a way of, the, of their entering their stories. So I, and I, it's not, it's something I'm, that I, that I'm aware of, right? And so my characters will have that lens. And so I, I, as much as I go back, I know, I know that that sort of that there's that limitation that I'm not there every day. But that's why also in the broader work that I do, I try to, um, you know, bring the word works of Haitian writers who are currently living in Haiti to my readers. And, um, and because I feel like that complicates the conversation that adds layers, even for me to what I'm doing, if they can read other people who are working in the same period of time that I'm doing. So I work um, and encourage and try to, you know, write a lot of prefaces. I work on a lot of translations, even behind the scenes, like try to introduce publishers to writers in Haiti that they could translate because I feel like the more voices we have the better a better a bigger view of Haiti we can have here at least for the readers who are reading me so that's what I that's how I try to sort of level up the conversation to try to bring in also as many other voices as, as possible like with the Haiti Noir and Haiti Noir books that was uh, part of that attempt and I um, edited another anthology called The Butterfly's Way sometimes back about what it's also like to be young and, and live here in the United States and to be young and Haitian and live here. Well, I think you're succeeding and I, and I think everybody appreciates the, the layers, as you say, because the, the, it expands the breadth of what you're doing. So keep doing Absolutely. it. <laughs> I, don't think, I, I don't think it helps to be like, it's a big burden in some ways like to be like the voice I don't it's not something that I have ever sought or welcomed or desired <laughs> you know I think it's like my mom used to say like you know the more 
light you have in a dark room, the dark, the lighter it get, you know, the better you see. So it's it's sort of um, to be the. It's not helpful to anybody to just have like one person yeah. doing anything. Okay, great. Okay, I have a question now from a graduate in the Bahamas, and you mentioned writing in English, and and um, his question is. You write in English, not French or Creole. Is it because of the age you came um, to America or what other factors influence this? It's absolutely because of the age that I came. Um, when I was 12, I was I spoke Creole at home with my family and in school I spoke French, but I never felt really comfortable writing in French. I, I didn't think I could be, I don't think to this day that I could write creatively in French. Um, so um, I just, when I got here, I learned English and I felt like also it was this language that I could um, be free in and, and probably because it was new to me and I didn't have to sort of worry about what my relatives would think. So it offered that kind of freedom too, but it was absolutely that the age that I was and I was sort of becoming creative at the, at the same time that I was like learning English and they, and they sort of melded together. Okay, interesting, very interesting. Um, I have a question now from another graduate in Jamaica who I guess was listening to us talk about the dew breaker. And they said, the wife of the dew breaker, she is able to remain married to a man she knows who is unspeakable, He, you know, and he, she, they want to know what do you think this says about the nature of love and forgiveness? I think it says an extraordinary amount about that. And even I wrestled with that, you know, like how much I would forgive in her situation. And because it's not just like general, like it's very likely that he killed her brother, right? And his work. And so I, the wife is also very, very religious. Uh, she really believes in miracles. She's, she's one of those people who believes that miracles are possible. And I feel like her, she feels like her love was a miracle. And she feels like she saved so many human beings by, by attaching herself to this man. Now, so and in a way, it's, it's, she loves him. She grows to love him. And they have a, a daughter that they both love. So she, but she feels like, look what we've created out of this, this evil. And, and there are, there's so many, I mean, there are women who are, who I, those women, I don't quite understand who are like the man on death row. I want to marry him. Um, she's not, she's not like that, <laughs> but she sees her love as, as miraculous. And, and I think that's the, you know, she sees herself as a very strong Christian too. And I think that's where she feels like this relationship is part of her living her Christianity and that she is able to save, she saved this one man. And the fact that she saved him means he stopped killing people. And I think that's the justification she gives to herself about it. Okay. I think, I think that's what I got, but I, so I, I'm sure that I've answered the question. <laughs> okay, let's talk a little bit about Breath Eyes Memory, um, which my daughter read in school. So um, I, I, understand that you started it in high school after writing an article for a New York City teen newspaper about leaving Haiti and coming to um, the U.S. as a child. Was that your main motivation for writing it or what was the main motivation? Yeah. Well, I first, I want to thank actually all the teachers throughout the English Caribbean <laughs> I mean, who are reading it because I just became aware of like a, a couple of years ago that it's on, like it's on an exam and and that so many people are, are are reading it, which fills my heart with uh, with so much joy. I mean, that I find that's very so wonderful, because it's you know I have such a special attachment to that book. It's my very first book, and I was probably when I started writing at the age of a lot of the young people when they're first reading it, and I started writing like about my coming to the United States as a young girl, and I. And then I thought, and then I wanted to write more, but I so like I should, I don't have more in sort of my own life. And so I started writing it as a, as a novel. And, um, and it tells, you know, of course, this traumatic story of, of a mother, the, the daughter, the narrator is born out of a rape. And so, and, and it fits in 
a little bit with the period that they were living in and it's the history it has that history and the history of migration so it's a story that i wanted to tell and when you're um <clears throat> when you're young and you're first it's your first book you kind of want to put everything in there <laughs> and i feel like i'm like oh okay one more thing one more thing i overburdened the poor girl i think <laughs> with with all these issues but you know, I wouldn't, this is the sort of what I was able to write at that time. And I feel like a lot of young people connect with it because it's also, I, re, I wrote it about the, the age, very close to the age that they are when they're reading it. Most of, most of the people who have been reading it um, for school, like your daughter. Yeah. Well, it's very interesting. I know that um, the, the concern for the, the daughter's sexuality, the virginity and so on is something that, um, when my daughter read it, she was, I think, 14, 15. So mm -hmm. it provoked some interesting conversations in our house. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. No, well, it's really, but you know what's interesting about it? It's just yesterday, I was at something at, the, uh, at Florida International University, and this young woman from Cuba, she's from a rural town, her, and she said, you know, my mom had that done to her, she said, like they were monitoring very much her mother's um, virginity so that to make sure that she's a virgin when she gets married, because um, in many, you know, poor families, it's not, you know, it's something, it's not all over Haiti. It's not, but it's in this family as it is in this young woman's family. And I've met so many, I've met young women from the Middle East. I've met young women from um, Asia, from different places. There's a young Korean woman um, I met a couple of weeks ago who, you know, they, who tell me, yes, our, our sexuality was very much monitored in our family because it was currency. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, if you wanted to marry a certain kind of person, they would insist that their wives were virgins and so forth. And so, I mean, when I, when the book came out, I, I really got in a lot of trouble for it because people were reading it like anthropology. Like I was saying that this is true of all Haitian women which was never my intention. It, what my intention was that this family, that's what they do. And um, the, the main character is trying to overcome it, is trying to, to live her life freely in spite of it, you know? And, and then they, I also meet people who are like, what's wrong with that? Of course, <laughs> you know, I'll meet like older women who's like, of course, that's how it should be. That's our job as mothers and so forth. So <laughs> you get all, kind, all different types of reactions. Yeah, and that's, I think, the beauty of, of a book. It opens people's minds and, and you get lots of different perspectives. So, yeah. Okay. Now we have a, a question from a graduate in Grenada. Is Breath Eyes Memory autobiographical? Well, it's not fully autobiographical. It's, um, I would say there are parts of it that are autobiographical. And every book that I, that I write, I feel like I borrow pieces of me, certainly, because I, you know, you're, I'm the source. And, and there are people in my life who have had that experience, certainly. Um, and I, I came here when I was 12, but I wasn't born as a result of a rape. You know, I, my, I had both my parents here. And so I was able to pull on certainly the stuff about school, like what it was like to start school. And, and my parents were certainly like education driven to a fault. Like, you know, you had to succeed in school. You had to get certain kinds of grades. So those things I certainly, Used, but I also borrowed and invented. I mean, that's the beauty of a novel, and that's why I didn't want to. When I when I went from essay to novel, I did it so I could invent things, you know, for the character. Mm -hmm. Definitely to be more free. Yeah. And I think that the education thing is common in all Caribbean parents. Um, yes, I think it's a, a way to to rise. So, um, and we now have a question from a student in Anguilla. Uh, who says, do you think about being a role model, a representative for your culture? Well, I hope I am, but you know, there's always the danger in that and that. So I try not to per, put myself out there as such, because one of the things that you also find, um, and I found with Breath Eyes Memory and after that, you know, people also will say, who do you think you are to think you speak for me, right? And so there's also that side of it. They're like, she doesn't, you know, I, I'll, I've gotten that too, or she doesn't speak for me. That's not my experience. I don't, I don't want any association with that. And there will always be people who think like you sort of get more attention than you deserve. And so I don't, you know, I don't put myself out there as that, but I know that 
that what I do also in, has inspired people. I've met so many people who tell me that. I, you know, I met a young woman who was in foster care, for example, and she said, you know, I used to, she said, I went from home to home and all my stuff was in a trash bag. And the only thing I had always with me was Breath Eyes Memory that a teacher gave me. And she, you know, she was a grown woman now with kids. And I could have never imagined that the book would have, you know, when I was writing it in my little room in Brooklyn, I would have never thought that that it would mean something like that to someone. So I don't underestimate that, but I don't put, put myself out there like, hey, I'm your role model. <laughs> I just like, I, if you want me, you know, I, you know, it's, that's the power of literature too, right? That the work can just have its own path, you know, it can have go on its own journey. There's a um, Haitian proverb that's in Breath Eyes Memory, actually, Paul gain pied, Paul gain zel, you know, words have wings, words have feet. And you never know how far the, that will travel. So I, that's that's the power of 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 what what I read, what I write, you know, as well. You know, the power the power of the work is its own. It makes its own journey to people's hearts. You know, if they're open to it. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. That must be very satisfying for you. Um, okay, Claire of the Sea Light centers around a man who is faced with the question of whether or not to give his very beloved daughter away to a woman who he feels will give her a better life. How did the idea of this very kind of heart-wrenching choice come to you? Well, I was, right, I was watching a documentary one time about children in, in Haiti who were not really orphans, but whose parents whose, uh, were you know, economically disadvantaged, were poor, who couldn't take care of them. And so they would bring them to these orphanages and they would go and visit them and spend time with them. And so one of those children was adopted by this family, this white family who said, well, and then they were interviewed and they said, well, you know, they, they, don't, they don't feel about their children the way we do. That's why they give them away. And I thought, oh my goodness. And so I was so sad and angry and, and you know, just kind of upset that we have to be in that position with our children because my parents left me with relatives, you know, with loved ones, but they still separated from me to make a better life. And so, and then, the, and then I went to sleep and I had this vision of this little girl, um, Claire Limielle, you know, Claire of the Sea Light. And that's how the story started with her story and then her village. And, um, and so this thing of also sadly people either, you know, their children who are put in servitude, you know, like Vistavec, but their children who are also given to family members to raise. And, and so I, like, like I was, and like a lot of friends, I'm sure in the Caribbean, especially the the care, you know, those of us who might, it's a very familiar story. My grandma raised me, my aunt raised me, while my mother, my life, you know, was out working or so. Um, but this was, you know, this little girl. I thought was, wow, I want to follow her around this town and write this story, and mm -hmm. I wanted to base it in this coastal town where my family um, is from in Leogan but create my own town, you know, Ville Rose, which now has started to appear in different ones of my books. Very interesting. Well, you have two daughters, one who I guess at the, at the time was close to age in Claire. Mm -hmm. And I understand there was a CNN documentary called Girl Rising. Does, does Claire's character owe anything to your amazing girls in any way? Yeah, well, you know, having, having my girls really made me think we think also the way I write about motherhood and the way I write about girls, because I have sort of in the daily life, the extraordinary example of watching little girls grow. I have a lot of little girls in my family, but I have, you know, wonderful nieces, but watching up close that experience of now my oldest, who actually is on the cover of Claire of the Sea Light. She, well, she was the same age as Claire would have been and now it's 13 mm -hmm. and um, it's a teenager and it's like uh, interested in, in clothes. Like I, you know, it's like, what's to buy her? It's like all that experience of watching a human being, especially a, a, a young girl. Um, and I like last year was a very interesting year for me because she was 12 and I was 12 when I came to the U S so I was kind of like always watching her to see where I was, you know, at that age. So yeah, it's completely, um, been very interesting and also to to feel that kind of love for for 
your children, but also girl children who look like you on some level, who are experiencing some of the things. I think that's deepens. I, people always write, ask writers about motherhood and how it changes them. And I think that's part of the question too, is that it, I feel like it just, it just makes, grows your heart so much bigger, but it not just, and, and I was able to write Claire because I was able to think of my Mira as, as Claire, you know, and, and what that would be like to be the father in that situation. Mm -hmm. Well, I empathize because I, I also have two daughters and um, it's been an experience. It's been a joy. It really has yes. been a joy. So, and I'm sure it will continue to be a joy. So yes. that's great. Thank you. Okay. Now we have a question from a St. Kitts and Nevis graduate who would like to know what you think about U.S. immigration law and the U.S. Haitian relations, especially at this time in Trump space. Oh my goodness. U.S. immigration law is so... Um, heartbreaking at the moment. You know, I just worked on this video, um, series of videos called We Have Rights, and I did a, a Creole narration, and it's for people who, it tells you what to do um, when immigration comes to your door. It's basically, and even as I was narrating, it says things like, you have to ask for their, for their warrant. And I always, and I was thinking to myself, would I even have the courage to do that if some armed people came to get me? And and even in the neighborhood I live in in Miami, you see the you know you see the immigration vans go by in the way that you didn't before. There are all these raids now um, where people are picked up and um, and people are picked up. You can be picked up in the hospital. You know you can be picked up. You can go for your immigration proceeding and get picked up and deported. And you know recently with uh, temporary protected status being taken away for Haitians. In July 2009, something like 50,000 people might are risk being deported. And the Salvadorians recently, the um, Liberians, and um, so um, it's very, it's a very, very tough time right now. And people are certainly afraid um, in terms, you know, to to be immigrant, especially to be, you know, to be undocumented. And Trump's America. I mean, it's 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 a very I, when I just came in the 80s, it was a little bit like that in the Reagan era where they had the raids, the immigration raids and so forth. But it just it's just really a little bit, um, it's, it's kind of terrifying for a lot of people, just generally what's mm -hmm. happening overall in the country with immigration. Yeah, I wish there would be more coming together rather than division and, and mm -hmm. hate. It would, it's, well, I guess we we'll just have to see how we all weather the storm. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I now have a question from a graduate in the UK. Um, I guess as we were talking about your daughters, he's asking, if your daughters decide to become writers, what advice would you give? And how do you think your stories might influence them? Um, I would say, you know, get a, a, a backup job, <laughs> at least initially. <laughs> It's good. I think, I think, I think it's so important to also live in the world, right? To have it to have some experience in the world, um, to do, to, to be exposed to, to other things, um, as you're writing. So, so it's not like you're, you know, you're sort of just to have a narrow focus. Um, one of my, one of my daughters really likes to write, but she's always afraid to show me. <laughs> I think cause I'm, I might be a kind of a tough critic, <laughs> but she's a little bit afraid to show me her work, but I wouldn't, I would encourage them, but I would also say, you know, Try other things, live your life too, and just like see the see things in the world before you decide like what you want to focus and write about. Okay. Good advice. Good advice. Um, a question from a graduate in Trinidad and Tobago. She's asking, do you think your artistic vision is evolving? Absolutely. And that has to do with the very simple thing of age. You know, I'm I started Breath Eyes Memory was um, published when I was twenty-five. I'm Next year, I'm going to be 50. So, and you know, I've had, like when I started, I had no children. I had both my parents. I have now buried both my parents and I have two children. My family has expanded. The, you know, the world has changed around me. So I think absolutely. Um, and I, I feel like now I, I'm trying very hard. One of the things I don't want to do is repeat myself. You know, some of the things that I've written before and to try to write with more nuance, you know, and, and that comes with age, with more reflection, with, with less haste in some ways in terms of 
you know, in the sentence level, you know, to try to go as deeply as possible in the, in the work that I'm trying to do. Okay. Well, I look forward to the upcoming works then. <laughs> Um, I should mention, too, that you also, from 1993 to 95, did some documentary film work with Jonathan Demme. And you also taught at universities in New York, Miami, and Texas, just to show the variety of your career. So you co-produced documentaries on Haiti with uh, Jonathan, and I believe you've even had a, a bit part in one of his um, films, the 1990 film of Morrison's novel, Beloved. How do you like acting? How was that? Well, it was really, it was a lot of fun. I, film is kind of my other love. And, um, and so I, when I left, uh, got my master's in fine arts, my job right out of school was with Jonathan, um, working with him. And they were, when they were working on Toni Morrison's Beloved, I was an extra. I was one of the 40 women in there. If you blink, you'll miss me. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it was wonderful to do. And, and then, um, and I worked on Girl Rising, which you mentioned before, which is a documentary about girls' education. And it's worth seeing. People can see little clips on, on YouTube of all the different, it's, it's, it's a documentary about girls trying to get an education in seven different countries, from Egypt to Haiti to Peru. It's really fascinating. It's, it's, it's an incredible documentary. And I worked on one called The Agronomist about a journalist in Haiti called Jean Dominique. And sadly, last year we lost Jonathan. We're coming up on the... Um, one year anniversary of his his passing. It was a really great loss, both for for me as a, a friend of his, but also for the world, for the kind of film that he did. And I worked on a film called um, Stones in the Sun, where I have a more like a fuller acting role, where I play a professor <laughs> who um, who sort of who leaves Haiti after doing. There was a moment after the dictatorship, and where where. It was a transition between the dictatorship ending in 86 and then the elections in 90, where you had these military people who were in power. And so it's, the film is during that period and, and it talks, it's about exile. But it's fun. It's, it's, it's fun because I'm, I'm not trying to win an Academy Award. So it's like, it's an artistic risk, you know, to do something new. But it was really, it, it sort of revealed a, new, a, a different part of myself to me in this kind of, you know, doing this kind of work. But it also makes me very grateful for the way I work because for what I do, all I need is a piece of paper and a pen. And, but the film thing, you know, it's like you need dozens of people for it. And so I'm always, I go back from film and thinking, Ooh, I'm so lucky to just be able to create my world in this way. <laughs> That's true. That's very interesting. I'm sure a lot of people are going to be looking for YouTube now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, as we wind down, I have another question from a student in Jamaica, and they say, do you turn to writing both for ins inspiration and solace? Absolutely, absolutely. It, I feel like writing is one of the ways that I, I meditate, that I pray, that I, absolutely, it's very um, healing for me. I mean, even if the things that I'm writing about are disturbing or, or unsettling, I, I, I find a home in writing, you know, it's, 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 a, it's the, it's kind of a permanent home on the page. Absolutely. And it's, is it that you, sometimes you're able to work out some of the disturbing things by getting them on a paper and away from you? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's also, and in the nonfiction things that I do, it's sort of, you, I write to figure out like how I see something too. You know, you might start out writing, thinking I'm going to write from this position and then you go through and then you just have a more nuanced view of what you think of what of what other people are thinking so yeah it's 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 worth like when i'm not i'm very unhappy when i'm not writing and i feel like i would write whether people were reading it or not okay that's wonderful that's wonderful okay you've received many awards is there one that means more to you than others um hmm they all, you know, they all have their own particular meaning, but I, I'll just, one of the memories I have of the first time I was nominated for the National Book Award, I was 26. I was, I think, if one of two of the youngest people like nominated for it, it's like me and Philip Roth, you know, he was, and I was like, we're both 26 when we're nominated for it. And I remember going with my entire family to the ceremony with my mother, my brothers, and my mom at some point, you know, I was always in my room just kind of like typing away from the time I was 14. 
And my parents, I was shy, I didn't show them what I published. And they were really, they didn't know what I did. And the book came out and their friends were saying, oh, it's about sexuality, tell her to stop. And then, <laughs> so, and then when Quick Crack came out, one of my mom's friends said, oh, she says you, in that book that you played a lotto and my mom's very religious. So she was worried about being condemned for playing a lotto. <laughs> And so we all went to the ceremony. So in the middle of it, my mom was then, and she was like, all these people are here. And then so when they, I didn't win, but when they flashed my book on the screen, I was like the finalist. And my mom was like, oh, that, so this is what you do. And mm -hmm. I, th I think myself, not every day, and I'm not always in a gown at an award ceremony, but, but she sort of like, my parents suddenly in that moment, they got sort of like the importance of what I'm doing and, and what it meant to like to Haiti and the pride and what it, you know, they suddenly were really like, whoa, this is incredible. So that one will always, you know, the first time I was nominated for National Book Award for Krika will always have a special place in my heart in part because of it. I was able to have that moment with my family, especially absolutely. my parents. You know. oh, absolutely. Well, I'm glad that you have that. Well, as we end, um, I'd like to extend a special thank you to Edwidge Dontika, our distinguished honorary graduate and UE alumna, who joined us today on Pelican Talks. Edwidge, as you all know and have had reinforced today, is a world-class writer whose works have truly extraordinary power, and I'm honored to have been able to speak with her today. Je vous remercie beaucoup. C'était vraiment très spécial. Merci I was, thank you. Let me just say thank you to everybody who asked questions. And I hope we'll get another opportunity to do this again for longer. It was it was delightful. Thank you so much, Celia. Well, thank you so much too. And I hope that you we actually do. I'm gonna make sure of it. And we will be definitely keep in touch. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Howard Shand, who is our digital media and database manager, who facilitates this Google Hangout and without whom I would not be able to do it. And we look forward to all our listeners to joining us again on our next Pelican Talks where we engage alumni across the Caribbean and world. And we thank you very much for tuning in. So until next time, remember to show your Pelican pride and we will be in touch soon. Thanks again, and we have a wonderful rest of the day and we'll thank keep in touch. Thank you, bye. Thank you very much, bye-bye. <laughs> bye everybody.